Let's play a game. Line up Americans in a row, all of them, by how likely they are to start a revolution. At the front of the line, you might put, let's say, a student activist, or an energetic member of some aggrieved interest group, or some evil genius with a knack for computer programming. At the back of the line, you'd put, who? Who among us is least likely to go to the trouble of trying to change the world? I don't know. A lot of us are complacent, but somewhere near the end of the line, I think we can all agree, we'd find the golf and tennis coaches of America's country clubs. When I hired on to be a tennis pro at a middle-class country club in Seaside, California. Tim Galway is the name of the board tennis pro in this story. He's in his 80s now, but was in his 30s when the story begins. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. I'd been teaching all day, not coaching. And it gets a little boring telling people uh, where the weight on their foot should be and where they should hit the ball on the racket. On the afternoon in question, Tim was teaching a guy with a slice backhand who wanted to learn how to hit topspin. The guy was taking his racket back too high. Ordinarily, Tim Galway would just have told the man, hey, don't take the racket back too high. But he'd lost interest in the sound of his own voice and pretty much everything else. So he just kept quietly tossing balls at the guy's backhand. Within three or four minutes, a strange thing happened. He was hitting topspin backhands. I had said nothing. But then I said something in my head. You lazy bum. You missed your chance. If you had only taught him before, then you would have gotten the credit for his topspin backhand. I said, wow. And this was maybe the key point. I'm more interested in teaching than I am in the student learning. That was the moment that Tim Galway had an idea. Because I just said, okay, I'm going to see how much improvement I can see in front of me with how little teaching. For reversing your usual approach. Absolutely. How little can you tell them rather than how much can you tell them? Exactly. So, so you have this insight about yourself and your teaching methods, and you decide you're going to do it a different way. You're going to see how little you can say. Mm-hmm. How long do you do that before you start to think, I'm on to something? Uh, my next lesson. His next lesson is with a complete beginner. She doesn't even know how to hold a tennis racket. Galway thinks maybe he shouldn't try out this new idea, coaching by not saying anything. Then he thinks, nah, screw it. Let's try this again. How can I start a beginner without telling the fundamentals? And so I said, well, I'll just drop a few and hit them. So they'll see me. They'll see me. I did that five or six times. And she said, I noticed the first thing you did was turned your right foot sideways. I said, yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. And just... Take these balls and... And do it. No, I did say, uh, shut your eyes and see yourself hitting the ball. I didn't say like I did. And this is the absolute truth. She hit like this, like this. I mean, everything I would have told her. She didn't know any different. Her foot didn't move. So the one thing she consciously thought about, she didn't do. Exactly. Everything that was just kind of unconscious, she did. I said, oh, my God. Not only did she do everything without instruction, but she didn't do the one thing she decided herself she should do. In the history of coaching, this is a revolutionary moment, a who put chocolate in my peanut butter moment. Galway discovers that performance is all about focus. Focus on the wrong thing, and you'll do the wrong thing. What shocked me and what thrilled me was to see tennis improving without the student trying to improve. 
all I would do is ask them awareness questions or give them awareness instruction. Awareness instructions, meaning saying stuff that caused them to focus on what was useful, like where the ball was when it hit the racket. People love Galway's weird tennis lessons. He offered no criticism, no praise, hardly any talk at all, just a nudge here and there to silence the voices inside their heads, the voices that caused them to tense up. One day, one of the country club students blurted out, you should write a book. Tim Galway had zero literary ambition, but he did it. He wrote a book about how to coach tennis. His text was one part Eastern mysticism and one part practical advice on how to crush your opponent on a tennis court. He thought about calling it yoga tennis. He wound up calling it the inner game of tennis. In the fall of 1974, right before his book came out, Galway asked his publisher how many copies they hoped to sell. 20,000, they said. Two, three quarters later, I'd gotten my third royalty statement, and it had gone from 40,000 to 80,000 to 100,000. And I went back to Random House, and I said, how come you were so wrong in your estimates? And he said, well, we thought it was a tennis book. The inner game of tennis is not a tennis book. It's something else. Which is why it's now sold something like two million copies. And Galway is inundated with requests from people who want his help. Because inner voices torture all of us, not just country club tennis players. I get asked to give a lecture about the inner game to the Houston Philharmonic. I play no classical instruments. At the end, they applaud politely, except for the conductor who comes up and says, I'm not going to believe this till I see it. And next thing he says is, who's going to volunteer for some coaching from Tim? As fate would have it, one tuba player volunteered, alone. Galway did the same thing with the tuba player that he did on the tennis court. Sir, what do you find most difficult? in performing at your level with the tuba. That's the one question that doesn't ruffle the ego. If you just say, what's the hardest thing? Mm, Nothing's hard. Uh, But what's the most difficult thing at your level? And so he says, articulation in the upper range. Never heard the phrase. And I say... What's so hard about that? Galway has not the first clue about playing a brass instrument. He doesn't even know the words you need to talk tuba. It's all he can do to listen. So he goes, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. And uh, it sounded good to me. I said, so how was that in terms of clean articulation? He says, ah, not so good. He says, so there was, it was dirty to some extent. How did you know? That's my ass. Well, I can't hear it because fell of the tube is too far, but I can feel it in my tongue. My tongue gets dry and it starts feeling thick. Galway tells the tuba player to stop trying to hear his own sounds and to focus on his tongue. So I said, don't try to keep it clean. Just notice the changes in moisture. It's only a few measures. (laughs) Sounds about the same to me. The whole orchestra gets up on their feet and gives a standing ovation. And you couldn't tell the difference. No. (laughs) What do I know? (laughs) And so I said, oh, my God, this is easy. Uh, I know nothing about tubas, nothing about classical music. and, uh, And I got everything from him that I needed. And... It seemed like magic to them. 
Now, this is new. The coach doesn't need to know the first thing about what's being coached. All the coach needs is a gift for playing around with people's minds. Two things follow from this. Anyone can coach anything. And anyone doing anything now needs a coach. I'm Michael Lewis, and this is Against the Rules, a show about various authority figures in American life. This season is about the rise of coaches, and this episode is about the inner game. The first big leap that inner game coaching makes is into the business world. Tim Galway starts getting requests from corporations to help them figure out how to coach their executives. In the early 80s, the Bell telephone monopoly was being broken up. The new head of AT&T corners Galway on a tennis court. He says, the people of AT&T now need to learn how to compete. Just a few years earlier, Galway had been nothing more than the local club tennis pro. Now the head of one of the world's largest corporations is inviting him to try to fix one of the world's largest corporate cultures. He started out just saying everything needs to change. So at the uh, end of the two minutes, summarizing how everything from the top level to the bottom level needed to change, he said, so, Tim, what's the problem? Galway told him point blank, you, the problem's you, your whole bossing people around management style. A monopoly could get away with being autocratic. But now that AT&T had to compete in the marketplace, well, everyone needed to stop listening to the boss's voice in their heads. The leader is the interference. Tiffany Gaskell is director of coaching and leadership at a British company called Performance Consultants International. Tim Galway helped to create the company 35 years ago after all these corporations started asking him for advice. When you're on the tennis court, you're in your head That voice is the one that's saying, oh, no, you're not good enough to do this. In organizations, because the leader is the one that knows the way, then the other people don't know the way. Performance consultants is still at the center of coaching the executive mind. But the inner game has become an industry. Gaskell guesses there are roughly a quarter million of these coaches worldwide helping business people to deal with the voices in their heads that make them worse at their jobs. I was working with the managing director of a waste company, waste management company, and every month they were missing their recycling targets. And so we sat down and he said, OK, so um, what's going on here? We're missing our recycling targets. And he explored his own beliefs around recycling and realized that he just didn't believe in it because he said, you know, we're just sending it on a boat to China. It's not really solving the problem. Here we have a common source of interference, not really wanting to do the thing you were meant to be doing because you don't believe in it. The performance coach helped the waste management boss create a recycling program that he could be proud of. And from then on, they hit their recycling targets. That's interesting. I mean, one response to this would be just to quit the waste management business. <laughs> but, but he didn't do that. Mm. He found a better way to recycle. Yeah. And finding a better way to recycle uh, eliminated this interference he had that he hadn't fully acknowledged. Yes. That the whole thing was pointless. Yes, exactly. So it's like as we become aware of stuff, then we, can, we have a choice and responsibility to do something about it or not. About now, I can hear Bobby Knight throwing a chair across the room. I mean, what is this bullshit? It all started on some country club tennis court. And these mind coaches, or performance coaches, or whatever you want to call them, they've only got a few simple ideas that they repeat over and over. The voice inside your head needs to be managed. Screw that. I don't have time for head cases. Criticism and praise are equally counterproductive as they both amplify the inner critic. Suck it up, you wimp. Focus your attention on things you can control rather than the things you cannot. Work your ass off and you'll control everything. On the other hand, Bobby Knight might be shocked by who's finding this stuff useful.
Before the break, I talked about how coaches are now being brought in to help people who've never had coaches before. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So we don't rise to the occasion. We sink to our training. Right? You've got you to gotta put together effective routines to operate well under pressure. There's a mental game of firefighting. H- huge. That's Jason Bresler, former baseball player at the U.S. Naval Academy, lieutenant in the Marine Corps, fought in the Battle of Fallujah, fought other battles in Afghanistan. In between battles, he joined the New York City Fire Department, where he now fights fires, among other things. The challenge that our generation has is, one is the complexity of these events that we go to. They're just ever increasing in complexity because there's the active shooter threat, there's terrorism, there's transportation accidents, there's biological exposure, all these, like it's, it, we do far more than just go to fires. No two emergencies are the same, but they all have one thing in common, an inner game. All right, more stressful that time, hopefully. What do we think? 100% different stress level. Why? I my, my heart rate was elevated. Uh, I was breathing a lot heavier. I ask guys, like, do you ever have a negative conversation with, your, with yourself? You know, like in a moment where you're just like, don't suck, right? Or you now you make a mistake and you're like, I freaking suck. And universally, every single guy, particularly the, the most experienced guys that have been to so many fires, and they say, yeah, all the time. Jason fights fires himself, but he also helps to run the training programs for firefighters. And he noticed that firefighters didn't usually dwell on their inner states. They fought fires. They didn't talk about the conversations they had with themselves when they did it. And at first they look at me like I was kind of crazy, right? I'd say, well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Do you recognize that conversation isn't the least bit helpful? And everyone would say, yeah. I'm like, well, is it easy to change that conversation? And they're like, hell, hell no. All of them were game to be coached about a thing they hadn't ever really put into words. So Jason brought in a 29-year-old mind coach named Ben Oliva. One of the things we're trying to do here is speed up the path to being an expert. So This coach wears jeans and a hoodie with a kangaroo pouch. He'd never fought a fire. He'd never been in a fire. He might have started a fire to roast marshmallows or something. He knows fires the way Tim Galway knew tubas. But he's talking to a group of firefighters who seem to believe he can make them better at their jobs. What do you guys think is the difference between routines and superstitions? Not much. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that there is a difference. (laughs) Does anyone have a guess? Ben has a laptop and a PowerPoint. The firefighters sit in a semicircle around him. Firefighters always seem like they're waiting for something to happen. Okay, so your, your superstition, if like, you don't do it, you can't perform well. Yeah, like a lapse of your routine is going to throw you off. So right. it's kind of like they're tied together, but if this happens, then this won't happen. You're pointing to an important point here, which is that superstitions often give us the impression that we cannot be successful if we don't do them, whereas routines are more flexible. Ben studied astrophysics and psychology at Williams College, where he also played baseball and football. At Williams, he noticed that some of his teammates were just way better in practice than they were in games. Why was that? He left Williams and got a master's in sports psychology. Now he coaches the minds of players for the Boston Red Sox and the New York Giants, also a bunch of lawyers and doctors, and some actors and singers you've heard of. Ben Oliva does the same work with firefighters that he does with everyone else, starting with trying to eliminate interference. Yeah, the distractors. What are the things that pop in your head that you end up focusing on that you don't have full control of? Decisions that are fire that already have been made and executed. Past decisions. Excellent. Other people's readiness. Other people's readiness. Okay, so you know, like other people's performance. Yeah. Yeah. Other people. Time of year. So, so external just, factors yeah, in the right. environment. Weather, excellent. That screws so many athletes up. Oh, it's cold. I can't play one. One of the guys said girls. Girls, That one gets me a lot. There's one really big one that I like to point out that we haven't hit yet. Past mistakes. Past mistakes. I can sort of understand baseball players getting hung up that way. They're all head cases. But firefighters? Tactically, technically, he's not going to make us a better firefighter. Jason Bresler again. 
He says he can see the effect mind coaching has on the way that fires get fought. In the course of adopting these techniques and applying them, we're, we're likely to become a better version of ourselves, which then inevitably is going to make us a better firefighter. Who doesn't want to accomplish that? Plus, it's like you're a nobody unless you have a mind coach. That's got to be part of this, right? I mean, if everyone else has a mind coach and you don't, how can you compete? How do I compete? Hey, Michael, hold up a sec. Just need to adjust your mic. Rolling in Berkeley. So I've just made you performance coach to Against the Rules. You are our mm. podcast performance coach. And I bring you in for the first conversation. And you come sit in our studio. Mm. What are the things you ask me to try to figure out, try to diagnose yeah, problems well, and... Okay, so um, should, we, should we do this? Should we do like... Um... Yes, let's do this. Tiffany Gaskell of Performance Consultants International. I just finished interviewing her and was about to let her go. But you can't talk to one of these mind coaches for long before you start thinking about new uses to which they might be put. Yeah, because none of the people who have worked on the podcast have improved in any way. So they're just <laughs> trapped in their own little worlds, and I just think I think what I think of them. And But nobody's made any progress at all. Uh, so it would be nice if we could go somewhere. Uh, I don't know where. So help us. Uh, so I'm just putting my hand on my head at the moment because um, there is, um, so the come from, right? That's the first thing that's really important. The first thing that's, is that it is not a remedial thing. So, Michael, um, in terms of me coaching you, then it's like I'm going on a journey with you and walking, walking down a path. So what I would ask is that essentially we work on you, not all the people around you. You see what I mean? Oh, right. The leader is the interference. I almost forgot. Okay, so let's start this. So, Michael... Uh, if you had uh, something you wanted to be coached on, what would that be? Um, you mean how would I like to improve? Is that the question? Um, yes, that's a good one. Here's what. Here's one. It's it's not huge, but it's noticeable. I don't like the way I am can be distracted by small irritations. A microcosm of this is just driving. My ideal state as a driver is detached amusement at the poor habits of other drivers. I have trouble staying in that ideal state and not not descending into bitterness and fury on the road. Mm. So I, that's that's just an example. Yep. But I, I assume if I'm that way in the car, I'm that way with other things. And I, mm. and I don't see any benefit to the bitterness and anger I feel towards others when they are inept. Okay. That is a great thing for us to work on. Okay, you ready to go? <laughs> yes. So um, let's imagine that you are sitting in the car. We're, we're doing your dream scenario now, okay? Um, I've got my eyes closed. <laughs> great. Me too. Uh, you're sitting in the car, and everything is just as you'd love it to be. Tell me about what that feels like. Um, it feels like being in a sensory deprivation chamber where I'm alone with my thoughts and the car is almost just driving itself. Mm. So you are enjoying being with yourself and moving along, getting to where you're going to. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like our goal for the end of this, let's say that um, something happens outside of your little bubble. How is it you mm -hmm. stay in your bubble? How would I stay in my bubble if yeah. I was trying to stay in my yeah. bubble? Well, if I'm in a good state of mind, I laugh. Mm. I see someone run a four-way stop or someone tailgating me or an ancient person going three miles an hour, and I think, ah, oh, different strokes for different folks. Mm. Oh, isn't it? So you've you got know, detachment I'm there. Detachment. You're detached. I'm detached. Mm -hmm. That's the way I... Otherwise, I start to get upset. And when you get upset, what's there instead? Um, a desire to wreak 
wreak vengeance <laughs> and uh, a kind of fury that is just inexplicable given what's happened. Okay. I desire to let them know just how awful they are as human beings. Okay. So we got judgment right there, right? There you go. A <laughs> lot of judgment. Okay. So there's the detached happy place. There's the judgment hell <laughs> place. Is that... Right. Yeah. True. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's just uh, get back into your detached happy place. I'm, in, I'm there. Great. Uh, just tell me about this bubble. What's going on inside the bubble? Yeah. What's the bubble like? The bubble's playful. Mm. Uh, it could also be seriously playful. That In the bubble, I'm thinking about uh, family or I'm thinking about more commonly something I'm working on. Mm. Like this long scene in the middle of this episode, I could be thinking about whether to let this tape just play or insert some narration to break it up, but I'm not because of the noise in my head. Okay, so have you got your feet on the ground? Uh, toes, yes. Great. So just putting your feet on the ground, do you feel that connection with the ground? Mm Mm-hmm. And stay in the bubble and... Mm -hmm. Just really feeling this positivity and the bubble around you. What color is the bubble? Blue. Light blue. Kind of a sky blue. Mm. And so you've got that all around you. Could be pink, too. Mm. What's the feeling in this bubble? Uh, It's warm and cozy. Great. There's no negativity. Yeah, no negativity. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how strong are you feeling this right now? At this very moment? Yes. Call it an 8. So what we want to do now is find a point on your body which you can associate this feeling with. So you've got your feet flat on the ground and Mm -hmm. you can feel this. um, It's resonating around you, isn't it? The the bubble. Mm Mm-hmm. Sometimes Um, blue, sometimes pink, but yes, it's mm -hmm. resonating. And so where's the place on your body that you can, like, for example, your chest to access this feeling in the future? Well, you keep mentioning my chest. It's hard for me to think of anything but my chest. (laughs) Sorry. Let me think about (laughs) this. That's being suggestive. Let me think about this. Okay. I'm feeling, yes, I feel like I'm being led to my chest (laughs) where it might be, who knows where it might be, my tip of my nose or my little toe. could be anywhere. Go for it. Um, I would actually say my toes. Great. And tell me about that. Tell me about your toes. And Well, normally you just take your toes for granted, right? Mm. Unless they're injured or they're unsightly and you don't have shoes on. But otherwise, uh, you don't really think about your toes. They're in your shoes. And But when you're really aware of your body and you wiggle your toes inside your shoe, it's a, it's a very distinct sensation and it's a, it makes you feel very self-aware. Mm. So... I'm wiggling my toes inside my shoes, and it's giving me pleasure. Can that give you access to the bubble? It might. It might. It might also cause me to hit the accelerator a little (laughs) fast in the car, but but it's, it's, um, but yes, absolutely. I could work on connecting the feeling of the wiggly toes to the bubble. So my request to you is that next time you're out driving, that this is what you do. All right. When you're faced with a situation that could get you into that judgment place. I promise I will do it. It seemed like such a simple request, but the inner game is not as easy as it looks. I came to this episode with one question. Why? Why are these inner game coaches now everywhere? I mean, they used not to exist. And it's not as if they required some new technology to make them possible. Leonardo da Vinci could have had this kind of coaching. Now, there was a guy with interference issues. Hardly finished anything he started. Maybe if he'd had a mind coach, Saudi princes would not have to shell out $450 million for fake Leonardos because there'd be so many real ones to choose from. Anyway, here's a thought. This explosion in mind coaching first required that a society give itself over entirely to markets. It needed life to be seen as one giant winner-take-all competition. It needed a new kind of anxiety. It 
So you, you feel like you've put a ton of time into the physical side, but the mental side, you haven't had that much direction in training. Ben Oliva, trainer of pro baseball players and Wall Street traders and New York City firefighters. He spends a shocking amount of his time coaching young people, teenagers, who've somehow become swept up in our general performance anxiety. And so you're interested in figuring out yeah. what you can do to get better yeah. from that. I know about you from what your dad told me. <laughs> but here's the thing. I work with lots of high school athletes, and parents are kind of an re- unreliable source I, of information yeah, sometimes. Yeah. So I'm not going to fully rely on what he was telling me. Okay. The girl is a 17-year-old high school softball player. She's hoping to be recruited to play at elite colleges. She thinks her father can't help her, but that's not new. Teenagers have always found their parents to be mostly useless. What's new is their urgent need to optimize their performance. We're going to refocus like we're training a puppy. (laughs) We're going to train your mind like we train a puppy. I'll time us for two minutes. Uh My suggestion is you close your eyes. You do not have to. On your marks, get set, go. I'll do it to you. Okay. These sessions are usually confidential, but he's made an exception here because the girl is my daughter, Dixie. A lot of the time um, when I go to bed, I have a bunch of things on my mind. So I was like, well, this is kind of a form of meditation. Let's see if I can. Because when we did it, like all I really had to focus on was that I wasn't thinking about the test I just studied for or like Uh the practice I just had. So I definitely had to restart a lot. We live in Berkeley, California, so a lot of Dixie's teachers already make her meditate. If they gave Olympic medals in meditation, we might just sweep. We'd also win recycling. Okay, so when you got distracted and then brought your attention back? Yeah. One of the other pieces of this is noticing if you judge yourself for being distracted. Right, because one of the bigger themes here is trying to manage our self-judgment. Use it in a way that's actually helpful for us rather than unhelpful. Yeah. I know she's my child because when she's told to meditate, her first reaction is to win at it. She may never have heard of Bill Parcells, the legendary football coach, but she'd agree with his most famous line. You are what your record says you are. Okay, so what's the problem with judging our success based on outcomes? Um, well, we get into a mindset where we think we're supposed to get on base every time, one. Um, and that's Mm -hmm. like definitely. Is that what you do? Are you kind of a perfectionist in that way? Well, that's the thing is like, I don't like, that's definitely how I am a lot more in high school. So that's the problem of judging ourselves based on outcomes is that we lose track of the things that get us the best outcomes. Yeah. So by focusing all our energy on the outcomes, we end up getting worse outcomes. Yeah. It's really kind of twisted. It's even more twisted than that. My child has been engaged in this insane competition for the attention of college coaches since she was 13 years old. The pressure on her grows every year. She has the sense that any given at bat might cause a coach to love her or to hate her and thus determine the course of her life. Every weekend, Dixie travels with her club softball team. It's one of the best teams in the country, and it plays against the other best teams. Wherever they play, college coaches gather to watch, but only because they are one of the best teams. If they started losing all the time, they wouldn't be invited to play against the best teams, and no one would want to see them play except maybe their parents. Lose, and the coach from your dream school, might never see how good you really are. To get a sense of what it feels like to be inside my child's dugout, probably also inside her head, we stuck a wire on her coach, who was reacting to some screw-up by one of Dixie's teammates. That one wasn't even in the dirt and you missed it. Get around the fucking glove, don't be, or the ball. Positivity. Shut up, Soph. I'll give you positivity. I know. You want to call Child Protective Services. And if Dixie's coach said this sort of stuff inside of an institution, a high school, say, or college, Some parent would complain and should be fired. But you know who'd be the most upset if that happened? Her players. Well, when you know her, you don't take any of that really seriously. Like, if that makes sense. Like, that's just her. Like, it's not. You don't, 
you just can't take it personally. Is it, was it harder to sort of keep your mind in the right place when you had a coach that you were intimidated by? That's me, obviously, talking with Dixie in the car after a softball practice. I mean, I was intimidated by her in the beginning, like the very beginning, but it was more, I just really didn't want to disappoint her. If she's not yelling at you, then you're doing something wrong. If she's not noticing you, then that's a bad sign. Why is that? Because she's not paying attention to you. She doesn't, she, it's like she doesn't care what you're doing. She, if she's paying attention to you and yelling at you, it means she cares. And that's the most important part. Oh, my God. We're losing this fucking team. Jesus not even the first half. Christ. Here we have a paradox. Why don't you try seeing the ball? That would be a good strategy is to actually look at it. Play at the highest levels of any competitive sport. You'll hear a lot of this sort of critical voice. You might even sense that you need to hear this voice to push you to places that you'd never push yourself. The paradox is that you also need to silence that voice, at least inside your own head. This comes up over and over again in Dixie's sessions with Ben, how much she cares about her coaches, but how hard it is to stay calm in their presence, and how hard it is to play well when you're not calm. I'm really hard on myself. For some reason, like, on that team with the coaches that I had, like, it's almost like I had, like, so much respect for them that I didn't want to let them down because, like... Your teammates. That and my coaches. And then another thing I do definitely when I'm nervous is like, I don't know, like my eyes almost like freeze and it's really stressful because I have like naturally really good hand-eye coordination. And so I'll still hit the ball, but I know if my eyes were on it, I would have hit it a lot better. Right. So think about that. That means your attention is somewhere in the future on what if this happens, what if that happens, rather than on the present moment, actually on trying to pick that ball up right out of her hand. So let's do a little exercise real fast, just to show you that you have control of your attention when you are aware of it. Right, so what's your attention on right now? Talking to you. (laughs) Right, I would would hope that it's on me, at least for the most part. (laughs) But if we want to, right, I can tell you, shift your attention to the way that the seat feels underneath you. The way that your weight feels on that seat. Okay. That's really a weird thing to pay attention to, right? Yeah. And it would be weird if you were sitting here talking to me, paying attention to that sensation. Yeah. Right? That would be like a really weird thing to be doing. (laughs) Yeah, that would be strange. But you can do it if you want to, right? Or you can just wiggle your toes. The point is that Dixie can learn to pay attention to the things that are useful to pay attention to. Her breath, for example, or the ball as it leaves the pitcher's hand. Just as the tuba player can stop trying to listen to his own music and focus on his tongue. Dixie needs to find the thing that helps to focus on. I don't know what the right focus cues are. This is personal. It's individualized. There's not, there's not focus cues that are best for everybody. But you just told me you hit your best when you're aggressive and loose. That sounds like a killer focus cue. Ben and Dixie spoke over Skype every week for months. Just the two of them. We taped only a few of these sessions, and even then we didn't listen in. But one day, when I was driving her home after softball practice, I asked her how it was going. And she told me that when she stepped into the batter's box, she now had a phrase in her head. Loose and aggressive. And uh, is it, like, how do you say it the way you would say it to yourself? Like you hear it in your head. Loose and aggressive. Loose and aggressive. Loose and aggressive. So it's light. It's not loud. Yeah. Um, What would have been in your head before you did those drills with him? Don't swing and miss. You have to move the runner. Um, Don't fuck up. Don't look at your coach. Typically, things that started with don't. Get rid of the don't. That's what Ben had been teaching her. The new strategy gets his trial run in a tournament being inspected by roughly 50 college softball coaches. 
the opposing team's pitcher is already signed with the University of Texas. She's lights out. Her drop ball drops, her rise ball rises, and her fastball comes in at 65 miles an hour, which is the equivalent of a 94-mile-an-hour fastball in baseball. Dixie's teammates all have trouble dealing with it. Everyone's striking out or swinging late. Everything feels like it's happening too fast. Here we go, here we go. Dixie now comes to the plate. Here we go, Dixie, get on time! The first pitch is a fastball, high and inside. Just extremely hard to react to quickly enough to hit hard. A month earlier, she'd have been frozen by it. That's the sound of the hit. It's a rocket down the left field line. She didn't just not freeze. She was ahead of it. She'd never reacted so quickly to a pitch in her entire life. After the game, I didn't say anything about it. I'd read the inner game of tennis, and the last thing my daughter needed was another voice in her head. She'd been coached to stop thinking and trust her reactions, which can be hard for a smart person to do. But eventually I debriefed her, asked her what she thought had happened. I developed a routine that acted kind of like a safety net for me, like knowing that I had a plan made me know if I executed it or not. And so having that as my goal, instead of focusing on the outcome, it made it a lot easier to not be hard on myself because I was like, well, I executed my plan, I did everything I was supposed to do, and it just didn't work out. And that's how this game works. So I just have to let it go and do the same thing next time. And Right. You know, like, because it, it made me realize that I cannot control everything. Right. My daughter is saying, I cannot control everything of her own free will. And I'm sitting in the driver's seat, about to drive home from softball practice, wiggling my toes at every intersection instead of screaming at the other drivers. And yet, there's still a part of me that thinks there is just no way this shit can work. Explain to me why like, like, people didn't figure this out 500 years ago. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Tiffany Gaskell again, creator of my pink road rage bubble. People have cared about performance for a long time. Yeah. Why wasn't Sir Lancelot when he was jousting? Yeah. Uh, why, why, don't, why, why wasn't he wiggling his toes or clenching his abs? Or, I don't understand. Uh, I'm thinking about the evolution of humankind. Yeah. And I'm thinking that we are in a place now where we are, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. There you go. So basically, like once you've got various stuff taken care of, so that's like survival, then we're going relationships, then we're going up to, you know, relationships with other. And then we can go into the place where we can self-actualize. And I think that a lot of the developed world is in that place right now. Are, are, you, are you just smuggling therapy into people's lives by calling it coaching and making them feel better about it? Well, actually, therapy is um, more about things that have happened to you in the past that you're trying to deal with. And coaching is really about, OK, going forward. You know, there's a saying, which is therapy is a path of tears and coaching is the path of laughter. There was one other surprise in all this. It occurred to me as I watched Dixie play, it had taken me longer to notice, and I was more hesitant to credit her inner game coach for it, even though the change was entirely in her mind. It seemed like she was aggressive there. Ben had come to Southern California on other business, and I dragged him out to see Dixie play. He said he didn't usually do this because he got so wrapped up in outcomes and started doing stuff that was counterproductive to his coaching, like cheering. Praise was bad because it was still judgy. Anyway, we were standing along the left field fence, surrounded on all sides by college scouts and anxious parents and screaming coaches. Me trying not to care too much about what was going on on the field. Ben actually not caring too much. Since she started talking to you, she's been, the two things I've noticed. One is uh, she's been much more aggressive in the zone without losing her discipline. So her at-bats have been very good. The outcome has not always been what she'd hoped, But it's been fine. I mean, she's hit well, pretty well. Um, But the other thing is, I think she's starting to learn not to be hard on herself. That's our focus. And, but but where I notice it is that when she's hard on herself, it's an expression of a more general trait, which is, she's very judgmental. She's hard on a lot of people. She's critical. And so she will sit there and be meant, she won't say it, but she'll have thoughts about it, critical thoughts about her teammates. And, of course, critical thoughts about her parents. Mm. And um, 
And learning to take that off herself, she's been noticeably nicer to me. Like, like all of a sudden, Tabitha turned to me a couple weeks ago and said, who is this child? <laughs> and so it's, I, I, I'm, I don't want to give you that much credit yeah, yet. Whoa, whoa, and who whoa. knows how long this is going to last. <laughs> and I've not said a word to her about any of this. But it's been, um, it's been really surprising to see just a little bit of hesitation before she goes into the, the critical negative mode. Winning's great. So is kindness. That kindness might help you to win? Well, you gotta love that. It looks like we're playing fucking a B-10 and under team, and it's two to nothing. There are like 700 softball coaches in Northern California that Dixie could have played for. There's a reason she insists on playing for this particular coach. It's not always easy or pleasant, but there's a point to it. Tim Galway might say the coach was creating interference. Dixie would, too. But she thinks the interference is important to have. No, that's bullshit. That's a bullshit approach to life. We can benefit from interference. We need coaches who teach us how to be comfortable being uncomfortable in a way our parents don't and probably shouldn't do. You need to stop being a lazy piece of shit and get around the ball and get your ass up and block and work for your pitcher or I'm going to kick your ass. Got it? Loose and aggressive. The trick is to let their voice into your head and then let it out again. Use it, learn from it, then learn to mute it. Yeah, Maya's going to get ahead in the count and throw strikes. Loose and aggressive, loose and aggressive, loose and aggressive. So fast, Haley, so fast. Loose and aggressive, loose and aggressive. Hey, get in your loose legs, here we go. Loose and aggressive. I'm Michael Lewis. Thanks for listening to Against the Rules. Against the Rules is brought to you by Pushkin Industries. The show is produced by Audrey Dilling and Catherine Girardot, with research assistance from Lydia Jean Cott and Zoe Wynn. Our editor is Julia Barton. Mia Lobel is our executive producer. Our theme was composed by Nick Bertel, with additional scoring by Stellwagen Symphonette. We got fact-checked by Beth Johnson. Our show was recorded by Topher Ruth and Trey Schultz at Northgate Studios in Berkeley. We got recording help this episode in Milwaukee from Jaw Media and Neo Soul Productions. Special thanks to Deputy Chief Dan Lipsky and Eric Nurnberg of the Milwaukee Fire Department and Jason Bresler, Christopher G. Iser, and Ralph Longo of the New York City Fire Department. As always, thanks to Pushkin's founders, without whom I would not exist, Jacob Weisberg and Malcolm Gladwell. My dad is totally oblivious to it, too. Like, he's just working out in the other room where I was originally setting up recording. He's like, no, 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 you have to get out of here. I'm working out. And I was like, Dad, I'm doing this for you also. (laughs) Like, I have this mic (laughs) for your podcast. Like, but yeah, I had to switch around everything. (laughs) He's like, get get out of my way. What are you doing? That's hilarious.